Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the League of Legends Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Sam, aka Just Casual, and we have an exciting guest for this episode. Every now and then, we like to bring, pe bring people that are helping the League of Legends community or just the general esports community and gaming community. So, this guest, you might be familiar with him. It is Luis Daylor. Hello, Luis. Hello, how are you? I'm doing well. So, if you guys do not know who Daylor is, um, I'm sorry you've been living under a rock for a few years, but <laughs> basically uh, Daylor has been the head coach of Fnatic, uh, Fnatic's League of Legends team uh, a while back in 2015 and 16, and actually, or actually more than that, but you won the uh, EU LCS split in those years, two splits, I believe, back to back, correct? Yeah, in 2015. Yeah, and then on top of that, he was also a he is also a director of esports performance for Movie Stars Riders, mm -hmm. as well as currently created his own company, uh, Digma. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so uh, let's break all those three things down. Let's first talk about what probably most of the people that are listening to this are really really excited about your experience as a League of Legends coach, because I believe before co before coaching you were also into poker correct yes yeah so how did that transition go um to be honest the transition was uh, pretty smooth so going back in time when i was in 18 19 i started playing uh, poker right now i'm 31 so it's been some time so <laughs> i was i was a professional for seven eight years and then mm -hmm. at some point i decided that i just didn't want to continue with it and and went into league and the thing is that i was a high stakes player and i coached and many high stakes players too. So what happened is that I got my my way of working in poker, and then I just uh, transform it or or make a transition of this information and this methodology into league. And to be honest, it worked pretty good because the kind of the psychological profiles of of poker professionals are kind of similar to league. And even though the games are are different, there's a very important similar component that is. Uh, you have to make decisions with incomplete information. So in mm -hmm. League of Legends is the fog of war, and in in poker is just let's say in Hold'em you have two cards in your hands that you in your hand that you see, but then you don't see the rest. So you have to be all the time uh, making ex uh, estimations, estimating ranges in poker, and then estimating mm -hmm. what's going on with the map movement and, and so on in, in League. So the transition was was very good and, and in one year more or less actually a bit more than a year i went from being a professional poker player to uh, being part of fanatic okay cool so i'm curious uh how did you even make that jump because i feel like for a lot of people that are in something completely different or might not have the exact i put in quotes exact experience when it comes to like league of legends coaching how did you actually make that jump because i think especially as spectators you just came out of nowhere i don't know if that's actually true or if you had connections how did that all happen uh i kind of came from nowhere that's actually okay. true <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh what i did is uh, at some point I, I was like okay i'm too bored of playing poker let's go into mm -hmm. something that's more fun and i just it sounds random but i was like okay i really enjoy playing league so let's go professional in league and at that mm. time i think i was like silver or something like this i just played casually and i enjoyed <laughs> the game you know so yeah. in uh, three months i went from silver to diamond three and mm -hmm. uh, uh, from that point uh, and to make it clear i this was like my job i was like playing league 12 hours a day uh, studying studying the game watching bots constantly analyzing my own games uh, learning from the top challenger uh, Korean players. And mm -hmm. so it was not just like I go to my chair and I grind the game and I enjoy it. It was like me trying to become actually, become good. Yeah, uh, everything was intentional, basically, yeah, that you exactly, were doing. Uh, exactly, okay. yeah. Everything was intentional. So um, there was a point that I, I felt that I was not terrible playing the game and I was ready <laughs> to play S5. And I started uh, contacting uh, players through, in a Spanish forum. Mm -hmm. And I started playing, like, not really competitive, but with other four guys and doing some trials. And I realized that most players that were at my level had no clue about the game. Like, they really knew nothing, but mechanically, they were so much better uh, better than me. And uh, while I was working on my solo queue grind, I forced myself to play the five roles and to learn multiple champions on every role because I really wanted to 
not not only become a good player, but actually master the game and understand everything that I could. So there was a point that realizing that if I was I was just mid diamond, so I was actually bad. I I, I could not compete at the level. I was thinking, <laughs> okay, so if these players that know nothing about the game are already better than me, uh, how long is it going to take? Uh, for me to actually reach the top, maybe the game mm-hmm. disappears before uh, I reach uh, mm-hmm. the top level because I just I didn't want to be a professional. I wanted to be one of the best professionals as a player. So at that point, I said, "Okay, so let's go into coaching because I understand the game so much deeper already than this level." And my uh, poker background, I already have. Uh, I think at that point, at that time, I had already like two thousand hours of coaching in poker on coaching high stakes players. So. I had uh, a lot of background on on coaching on poker, mm-hmm. so I said, "Okay, probably I can do the transition." And like in one month, I started coaching a, a professional team here in Spain, and I coached that team for uh, four months, something like this. It was one of a, it was a first division uh, team here in Spain, and I created a YouTube channel. And I did uh, some content. I opened a blog, did some content too, and started tweeting all this. And not much later, I got picked up by Fnatic. So it was, I was basically an unknown and uh, got picked up. But I think that all this transition happened because I already had, I actually was a real coach before becoming a coach. And most uh, league coaches are players and then transition into coaches. I Mm -hmm. I was a coach for many years already. So I had a head start on that side. Gotcha. Yeah. So it sounds like you did bring in like applicable skills. And it just took a look, you transitioned really well and you were really actually prepared for it. It's not like, who is this poker player coming in to play, coach Fnatic, a League of Legends team? Yeah. Okay. And for example, during my poker career, uh, there was uh, a seven month period where I was coaching an office of 25 players from mm-hmm. um, wow. mid stakes to, to high stakes. And I was 24 uh, seven coaching. Like I was not even playing poker. I was only coaching. And there were mm-hmm. other periods where I had like a, like imagine a boot camp, let's say, but the boot camp was three months and this was with mm-hmm. you know, also high stakes players. And I did uh, two times two and I coached around the world, traveled and coached different offices. So I coached hundreds of players. So I had a ext- extensive experience uh, coaching poker players. Wow. That's cool. So another question, uh, when we think about coaches, especially, um, Coaches for League of Legends teams and players, Mm -hmm. there's a thing where people talk about how the players are, can have, bring big egos into a team where they, I mean, they're top of the ladder in the ranking. So when you bring in a coach, especially back in the day when coaches were ex players that were at the top of the ladders, now you bring in a coach that is in diamond or sometimes gold and just not at the top of the rank ladder. How are you able to overcome? I guess that stigma where players think that coaches might not know enough because they're not ranked highly. Uh, so I think that that's so- something of the past, to be honest. Okay, or, that's good. Or, or may- maybe it's not something of the past, but because with the people that I've been working, I don't feel mm-hmm. this anymore. But I understand that this happened at the beginning and I really felt it when I was uh, coaching Spain before uh, going to Fnatic. Because once you start coaching Fnatic, okay, you're someone, right? But before I was <laughs> yeah. no one, right? So I had uh-huh. to prove that I knew something about League. So so how do you do this? So the first thing is that to coach on any thing, to be honest, you don't really need to be a master of that thing. What you need to be is a, a master at extracting information or the thoughts of that people. It's like guiding that people uh, to, to the point that they want to, to reach. So uh, for me, there's... Uh, something that that I I experience in poker and also experience in, in league is like I would split the the let's say I would split the the professionals into groups and also this uh, makes you sp- uh, split your your way of coaching. So basically, there's a, like a threshold that when they cross that threshold, uh, you don't really need to explain anything. You just need to ask them and extract the information from from their brains. Under that threshold, you have to teach them, right? So. Mm-hmm. Uh, with uh, in LCS level, I don't really need to, or at least not most of the time, I don't need to bring up everything. Most of the time, the players have the answers already in their head, but they don't know how to access, access this information. Also, what happens is that there are five brains, and then you have to mix uh, all this information. So if you excel at 
asking correct questions to extract this information and then you connect the dots and reach conclusions and mm-hmm. you're doing you're already doing a, a good job but you need players that have gone through this threshold because under this threshold you can ask the questions but they don't have the information in their heads so then you have to create yourself all this information and then you have to teach them but with high level professionals you can guide them by by asking uh, correctly and extracting the this information Gotcha. So, so go, going back to back to the point. <laughs> so, if you let's say you are coaching a team of gold players, something like this, mm-hmm. you cannot do this. You are going to have this problem, right? So, you need to have much more knowledge than them, right? But uh, if you are coaching uh, high level uh, professionals, then what you need to know is uh, not only how to extract this information, but how to lead the group uh, and also how to reduce the amount of conflict and. And then these are like soft skills that you learn uh, as a coach, really, or studying coaching yeah. or psychology and, and all this. So it's not really that much about league, but it's more about managing uh, a group of people, right? A group of professionals, managing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a talented group of, of professionals. So I think that threshold uh, really uh, splits the way of, of teaching, I would say teaching and coaching, right? It's kind of two different things. I see. Okay. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you for that. Okay, so we have a ton of stuff to cover and we don't have 24 hours to keep talking all day. So let's move on to your director of esports uh, position. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah. Um, so where to start? Um, so I, I can explain you more or less what I'm doing on, on Riders right now. Sure. So I'm the director of esports performance. So basically my role it, although it's centering in league, I'm also helping uh, a bit on the on the other games with structural uh, structure and so on. Is to coach the coaching staff and the players, and even coach, uh, let's say, from the CEO or the directors of esports and so on, mm-hmm. and create a structure that enables us to win uh, in the long term, in the mid term. And winning is like a consequence of the process. So let me explain this a bit. Mm-hmm. So a, normally a team just hires five players, a coach, maybe an analyst, and then that's their team and they have to win for one year. But what happens is this is really unreliable because uh, let's say that a player has an issue with his family or with his girlfriend or an issue with, sorry, an issue with another player or an issue with a coach or a player is missing, for example, it happens with Koreans frequently that they miss Korea. Mm-hmm. So then you have players that are underperforming because they have issues outside of the game. So this is something that is going to happen. You cannot really avoid it. So from my point of view, this is like a structural issue. And one way of solving this is having a 10-man roster. And you could think, okay, but having a 10-man roster, it means that you have to invest so much money. But actually, you <laughs> can have a, a 10-man roster with the same, by um, just paying the same that with a five-man roster. But just you have to manage your money in a different way. Okay. And... This is one of the things that I'm I'm working with riders, creating this uh, ten man roster, and of course, uh, having ten players requires having two coaches, more stuff, and you solve these kind of issues, but you you have other issues. So, for example, if you're having a ten man roster and you're swapping players, the synergy is going to be building slower. For example, just to give yeah. you one ex- uh, one issue that you can you you have. So right now I'm uh, creating with with riders this structure, and uh, the last split we had. We were able to have an eight-man roster because the Spanish league uh, only allowed uh, uh, up to uh, three subs, and we were playing with other two players online. And this split coming, we are going to have a ten-man roster in-house, and we are higher hiring uh, higher-level players, and we are uh, having a more qualified staff and so on. So it's kind of a I'd see this like an evolution. It's more like a marathon instead mm-hmm, of like a mm-hmm. sprint that normally. Uh, LCS organizations see every split as a sprint. Yeah. So yeah, that's more or less what I'm doing there. Okay, that's exciting. And then what? So this is a esports organization, <laughs> and they have teams in multiple games, correct? Or esports yeah, games. So yeah, they have uh, CS:GO. Uh, what's this? I don't remember the the name of the game, but it's a mobile game that is going uh, pretty strong lately. Uh, uh, Clash, Clash of Clans. Clash or Royale. I don't know. Yeah, something like this. The yes, card game, exactly. kind of card yeah, game card. thing. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, until recently, uh, they had uh, Overwatch, and they have uh, other multiple games. Okay. So how how is that? How are they getting into the League of Legends scene? Because I know NA is franchising. EU is 
probably figuring that out as well at this moment. Uh, how, mm. how, what's the plan for them for the EU? Uh, do you mean for riders in particular? I'm sorry? Uh, do you mean for this organization, for yeah, riders yes, in particular? Yes. So right now Europe is in a weird point where uh, r I feel that Riot doesn't really know what's going to happen exactly. I mean, yeah. they, they, if I remember properly, they announced that their uh, EU is going to be franchising in one year, but then this year there's no franchising, but there's no relegation uh, either. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently they announced that they are going to do a European tournament where the top two teams of every regional league are going to be facing each other uh, when the the playoffs in in the LCS uh, happen. Okay. So right now for for us this year is okay. Let's uh, finish this project that we started a few months ago. This team and roster, making sure that we have all the structure in position and we, that we have all the stuff in position. And of course, let's position ourselves to win the splits and and win this this European uh, league. That's basically what we are aiming for: having the structure settled and having the best possible results. Uh, as a consequence of this structure working properly. I see. Are you... And sorry, and just mo moving into the next year, depending on what Riot does, <laughs> we will see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a little abstract in what's going on. So are you involved in coaching that team as well or just directing esports <laughs> performance? Uh, sometimes I do it, but it's more like I coach the team as an example for my coaches to see. Not mm -hmm. really like I'm not there every day or something like this. Gotcha. It's more like, okay, so today uh, the team is going to be working on X, Y, Z, and I'm mm -hmm. there watching what's going on. And then I jump in to give an example of how to do something or, yeah, it's, it's basically this. So maybe I'm a few hours helping them, but mm -hmm. it's not like I'm the coach coaching them. It's more like I'm trying to teach the players and the coaches how to do their job properly. Cool. That's really exciting. Cool. So now let's talk about Digma. So. This is a company that's making keyboards. If I, if my research was correct, the reason why you went from coaching to this was basically you felt like you'd have a larger impact for the whole esports community, correct? Yeah, but it's not so straight. It was more like a sequence of, of things and kind of a conclusion, right? I, I, I was okay. in, I was coaching and, and then I, I felt that I didn't want to coach anymore because I felt that I was really close to to my cap in in coaching, and I knew that I wanted to do uh, something that had a bigger impact. And I started considering options. And after around a month of of considering different options that I, that I could do, I reached the the conclusion that I wanted to do this because it, it's aligned with my goal of professionalizing esports and having a a bigger impact. Okay. So let's talk about that process. How how did you get from there? To where you are with Digma? Um, okay, it's been it's been an interesting process. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I had this crazy idea of of uh, creating this keyboard. So, uh, when I was considering options, I realized that the keyboard hasn't really changed in around thirty years, mm -hmm. and the dif main difference is that now it's black instead of gray, <laughs> and yeah. and that it has LEDs, you know, RGB effects and, uh -huh. and all this. So I started studying started looking into ergonomics, how the body works. And all this is based on that. I had uh, a few players that had uh, wrist issues and like back issues, neck issues, and so on. Mm -hmm. And this had a real impact uh, in, in, in the time that I was in, in Fnatic. And I also know that other players had it in other teams. Yeah. So I thought that this would be something that could help uh, professionals. And it's not like a keyboard is going to solve every health issue that every professional has. It's not, not like this at all. It's a combination of factors. So it's they need to, uh, or we need to learn as computer users how to properly sit, uh, that we have to stretch, and that we don't have to sit for 10 hours in a row and all these things. Mm -hmm. And also we need to have uh, uh, proper design tools. And the keyboard is not really designed for gaming. It was designed, like the keyboard is a evolution of the design of the typewriter that is yeah. over one, 100 years old. And then slowly it, it transformed into what we have. So uh, at that point, what I tried to do is I tried to do a keyboard that was designed for our body instead of a keyboard that was designed 150 years ago. And I started with a much weird design. And from the point that, that I decided I wanted to make a keyboard, 
to the po- moment I had a uh, functioning a working prototype. It's it was maybe two months and a half. I learned three mm-hmm. D modeling, uh, electronics, and all this <laughs> stuff, and I was okay. able to uh, have a prototype uh, hand soldered and with a case three D printed and all this. So yeah, it was wow. a prototype, and. Um, this evolved a few months later, and then in January, we announced that we were doing this project. And this evolved a bit more, and we sold 50 of these prototypes. And uh, you know, we were testing these prototypes for two months. <coughs> uh, sorry. And uh, we reached the conclusion that the learning curve was too steep because this this keyboard had, it was a columnar keyboard. So you know that keyboards are staggered, you know, mm-hmm. like, like little stairs. And um, when you rearrange physically the keys, uh, you need much more time to adapt. But the thing is, the feedback on the ergonomic side was really awesome. So we, what we decided is, okay, how can we create a keyboard that has all these good ergonomic benefits, all these good things, but that it's really easy to use? Mm-hmm. And that's how we reached to the, the keyboard that right now we are selling on Kickstarter, that it's called Race. That basically it's a split keyboard with a normal layout that you can just snap together and you can just use it like any uh, other keyboard but has benefits like it has eight thumb buttons and it has uh, integrated palm rest that uh, raise your your uh, your wrist so mm-hmm. you reduce uh, the strain on the area you can split it so you reduce strain on shoulders too so yeah it has uh, many good benefits oh that's really exciting um what has surprised you the most about the development of the keyboard and prototyping and everything Oh, what has surprised me the most? Hmm. Probably, I would say multiple things, but when we launched the, probably three points, okay? So when we we launched the project on January, I was really surprised of how many people got interested because we were giving away five prototypes and we got like 3,000 people interested in, in, in the project. <laughs> uh-huh. That was amazing. And then when we were able to sold 50 prototypes, like a prototype, it's not something that you can really buy. It's a product yeah. halfway done, right? Mm-hmm. And we were able to uh, uh, sell 50 around the, uh, the globe and, and test for two months. That was also an uh, amazing experience. Then uh, as a company, when we decided to pivot, to go from this product to the product that we're doing right now, that was... Uh, like a really intense experience. Another thing that really surprised me is uh, then uh, at that point in the company, we were three guys and we, well, it was an electronic engineer, uh, product uh, designer and, and me, and we traveled to China for two weeks to mm-hmm. visit factories and, and partner with, uh, with uh, manufacturers and so on. That was also a really surprising and, and awesome learning experience. And then the Kickstarter that we've launched right now. So we launched it yesterday at 7 p.m. And in five hours, we already raised uh, $50,000. Wow. So that's 50% of the of the goal. And I don't know right now how we're doing because I haven't checked uh, because <laughs> we were talking. But before starting, we were like in 65% or something like this. Uh-huh. So it's just amazing the reaction of the of the community and, and how it's going and the feedback in general. So there's been many moments that, that has been really surprising and shocking. And it's been a growing experience. And yeah. it's been... In some moments, also, it has been really tough, but it's going good and I'm still alive, so I can't complain. <laughs> yeah, I bet it was a very busy and stressful time to get this all um, yeah. figured out. I mean, you guys did the, we've been talking a little bit about this and you guys had a really aggressive, fast <laughs> timeline. Uh, yeah, so I think that implementation is critical in anything that you want to do in life. Mm-hmm. So I am I always have a really aggressive timeline in anything I do. So, for example, uh, I consider it is really important to have clear goals. And even if you don't, don't know how you're going to reach that goal, that you have, okay, this is my goal and I'm going to do everything that I can to reach this goal. Okay. So, uh, for example, in poker, when I started playing, I said, when I'm, uh, when I'm 25, I want to uh, have earned $1 million, for example, this is a goal, uh-huh. right? And then I start moving forward uh, to that goal, okay? In League of Legends, I was like, okay, I want to be one of the best professionals in the world. And when I said, okay, this is going to take too long. Okay, <laughs> I want to be an LCS coach in this time frame, right? Uh-huh. And for example, with this product, okay, so I want to have a, a closed beta launch in this time frame. I want to create this prototype in this time. I want to have a Kickstarter in this time, you know? And then mm-hmm. you start pushing, 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 you know? And what happens is that when you start moving, okay, you start facing challenges. 
but normally you can move much faster than people think that you can, and you can accomplish so much mm -hmm. more than normally people think. So in my case, I don't see myself like I have a limit or something like this, or something cannot be done or cannot be learned. It's just yeah. a challenge and, and I can, I can do it. Right. So mm -hmm. for example, at the beginning, I had no clue about electronics, about hardware, about 3d modeling, about firmware, about nothing. I knew <laughs> nothing about this project, but I just started moving and I started learning, started doing. And by starting by doing moving forward and towards the goal that you, you want to accomplish, you start um, learning new things, meeting new people and pieces start uh, like the puzzle starts being done and, until you, you reach it. And even if you don't reach that, that point, you will be halfway uh, your goal and halfway your goal is already much better position than when you were yeah. a few months uh, behind. So for example, in my mind, when I started this project, over a year ago, I had like a deadline of, of when I wanted to launch my Kickstarter. That was a few months ago. And that couldn't happen because mm -hmm. of things that happened. But because I wanted to do this uh, Kickstarter, it happened a few months later, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm glad you made the progress that you have. And it looks like things are going really, really well. Thank you. I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the product now. Um, <clears throat> you've mentioned that you know, you've made a lot of decisions in design to improve the ergonomics to make sure that especially esports players are not straining themselves because they're spending a lot of time at the computer and playing games. Mm -hmm. So what about the casual player? Um, someone that, you know, has a family, has kids, have other responsibilities, can't play eight hours a day and are playing like maybe a game or two at night. Um, is this really necessary for them to invest into a a very specialized ergonomic keyboard? So I wouldn't say it's necessary, but I would say it's better. Mm -hmm. So normally, uh, may, maybe let's say that you're someone that you never work in the computer and yeah. then you play a game or, or, or two per day. Probably mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because you're never at the computer, right? So you're yeah. not forcing your body into this bad situation for many hours a day and then mm -hmm. many years of your life, right? Yeah. But if you're like a regular guy that uh, works eight hours in front of the computer, five hours in front of the computer, four hours in front of the computer, and then you go home and play a few games, I think, yeah, this could be beneficial. And the way we've designed it, the, the entry barrier is extremely low because mm -hmm. it's just a normal keyboard that you can split and has more stuff. And the stuff that we've added, it's, it's kind of easy to get used to. So for example, we've divided the space bar in four and we've added uh, four more keys underneath. So the thumbs naturally rest on that area. So mm -hmm. this means that you can, just by moving a little bit your thumbs, you're gonna be able to access these keys. And because your thumbs, you use two thumbs for only one key, <laughs> yeah. uh, you can get really, you can get uh, easily used to, to this, for example. Mm -hmm. Then another thing that we've implemented that had, has no uh, barrier is like, okay, so it, the keyboard has some, uh, palm rest integrated. You cannot really remove them. And this is a, a conscious decision on, on our side. It may, it may seem weird, but what happens with a regular keyboard is that when you position in your hand, you have this angle, okay? Mm -hmm. So a palm rest, what does is elevates your wrist so your wrist is in a neutral angle, right? Yeah. So for example, it makes, it's better on the long run and also it's more comfortable. We've tested this with coders, designers, gamers, and yes, the, the vast majority really, really like this. Just to give you two examples of immediate wins, just by getting the keyboard out of the box and plugging it, right? Mm -hmm. And and if you want to to invest some some time on it, so uh, two things: uh, one is hardware, and the other is software. And basically, it's customization. So on the mm -hmm. hardware side, as I said, you can split it. Okay, splitting it allows, let's say, easily, easily two things. So you can split it like this. Okay, mm -hmm. so you have your wrist straight, or you can even split it like this, like wider. So you can okay. put it at the at the uh, distance of your shoulders. So basically your yeah. arms have a more natural position yeah. and you can customize that how you want to. Got it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And also uh, the, the customization, the software options are amazing. Like you can create uh, multiple layouts and then every key is rebindable in every layout and every key can be a macro too. And every key in every layout can have special behaviors. So let's say, uh, let's say shift. Okay. When you press it, it's shift, but let's say that you tap it once, then it behaves like escape. But then you tap it twice and then it, it behaves like caps lock. Wow. So you can create, let's say you can have your numeric, uh, your numpad, you can have it on your left hand, or you can have your arrows on your left hand. So you can 
uh, design the layouts in a way that you don't really have to raise your hands from the home row. So this, oh, on the okay. long run, is gonna it's gonna be just more efficient. So if you want to invest some time on making this keyword on, on creating these layouts that uh, adapt to to your needs, then this keyboard has a much higher ceiling than any other keyboard. On the and on the hardware side, the same. You can split it and you can set it up in a way that is more more comfortable for you. And also, you can do things like uh, removing one side. So let's say that you're a CS player and you play with a really low DPI. So you move uh, at on the mouse. So mm -hmm. you you need a really large uh, area for for your mouse. You could split this keyboard and remove one side completely and play only oh, wow. with half. For example. Okay, great. And then, so the one thing I really like about this is the thumb, the space bar decision. You have a lot of buttons near your thumb. And again, like when I'm playing league, my thumb is hitting alt and space bar alt because I have alt binded so I can level up spells quickly. So mm -hmm. with all the buttons around there, I could potentially make that my thumb could be hitting control alt and shift. Correct. Exactly. So I can have it for like normal casting. I can have it for leveling up spells. I can have it self cast. And then I don't yeah. have to use my pinky because as a non FPS player that isn't used to having my pinky on control and shift all the time, that's super, super uncomfortable, especially to yeah. learn. Right. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. I'm, that's really, really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so I, another thing I want to uh, mention is because of the compact design, you don't have a number pad that's obviously there and there's no arrow keys, but you mm -hmm. still can access them through the keyboard. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, how we think about this is like when you're, your hands are on the keyboard, they're here. Mm -hmm. But then when you want to use the arrows, you have to move physically your yeah. hand. And when you want to uh, use the, the number, same, you have to physically move your hand. Okay. Mm -hmm. So instead of physically doing this movement, now, for example, you can press, you can, let's say, set up one of your uh, four left thumb keys. Okay. And when you press it, then you're on the second layout. Okay. Ah. And then in the same position, your hands are in the same position. Let's say on with your left hand, you can press this this key and then let's say you have here your numpad or you have here your arrows so mm -hmm. you could have your right hand on your mouse and then press one key with your left hand and have your arrows or your uh, numpad or your music controls or f keys or whatever here yeah. on the left so you can you can set it up in a way that you have to move your hands much less of course it would this would require uh, an adaptation period because you were used to moving physically mm -hmm. your hands uh, to an area where there were buttons now there are not buttons there they're in your in your same physical layout of your keyboard, but in in another in another layout. Gotcha. Yeah, that sounds really cool. So basically, even though you have less buttons on this keyboard, you still don't lose functionality of a, a full keyboard. Yeah, actually, you have more functionality than, than a <laughs> yeah. uh, full keyboard because another thing that is really cool is that the the software and the firmware are open source, and there's people already creating uh, plugins uh, to make it even, oh, okay. even better. So to give you a, maybe an example that's not particularly good for gaming, but it's good for coders. So our uh, the electronic engineer of, of the Digma project, uh, he's uh, creating a plugin that uh, one of his... I'm going a bit backwards. One of uh, one of his tasks is he he controls some servers. Okay, so mm -hmm. he, in the office he has like some badges that uh, are in green when the servers are on, and uh, when one of the server goes down, this badge turns red. Okay, so okay. it's an LED. Okay, so what he has done is that he has, by uh, by changing something in the firmware now the numbers on the keyboard are green, and one of these servers go down, then one of these numbers turn red. Oh wow! Okay, okay. so you can like the the, the amount of things that you can do with this firmware, it's just uh, amazing. Yeah. So what by what I said that you can have even more functionality than with a full keyboard is this, that if you're a coder or depending on what's your job, you could, you could, do, uh, you could make it so your keyboard does so much more uh, cool stuff. Yeah, it really sounds like uh, the keyboard is very portable. Like you said, uh, mm -hmm. it's magnetically removed and um, you can split it into two pieces. So it's mm -hmm. not really just for gamers, even though it sounds like that was the original intent. Mm -hmm. It's for mm -hmm. anyone that's behind a keyboard for a long period of time. I can see this like being really useful for anyone doing spreadsheets, accounting, yeah, like you said, yeah. coders, anyone that's yeah. doing video editing. I can just imagine yes. how many better shortcuts you can place on your keyboard yeah. where you don't have to move things around to crop videos and do Photoshop and just anything you really yeah. want to do. Yeah, totally. You're right. Uh, anyone that uses uh, shortcuts uh, should love this, to be honest, <laughs> because the customization the customization level is uh, incredibly high. Okay, great. Uh, is this also available? Does it work for Mac and PC? 
Yeah, Mac Linux PC. Yeah. Awesome. That's really exciting. So if people are curious about, oh, actually, before I go into that, one other thing, the price point. I know that mm -hmm. it's pretty high. <laughs> what, what can you say about that to give people comfort, especially people that are used to, you know, if they want to buy a cheap keyboard, they can buy a Dell for like 15 bucks. Or if they're trying yeah. to get into mechanical keyboards, you can find some decent ones for, you know, $80 or $150. Yeah, and even you can have you can find mechanical keyboards cheaper for fifty dollars or something mm -hmm. like this. Of course, the, the quality is not going to be top notch, but yep. you have mechanical switches. Mm -hmm. and it's it's okay. So, uh, to be honest, this has been like a business decision. So uh, the peripheral market it's already uh, I don't know how to say, it, but there's a lot of players inside this market, and there's a lot of big brands. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, every brand is basically doing the same stuff. All keyboards are the same and most mouses are basically the same and the same with headsets and, and so on so if you're coming into a new market and you you have to have some kind of competitive advantage so yeah. or or you have the the price advantage or you have the quality advantage or features advantage something from my point of view i personally not not even in digma but me as a person when i do something i want to be the best right yeah and i want to deliver real value to the people that we are working with or i'm working for so let's say that i'm coaching i want to give the best possible service to that person i want to give the most value uh, of, of our time mm -hmm. so the same with this project i wanted to create something that was better than that what you can already find out there and that's what we're aiming for and when, when you try to create something that that it's i would say top quality then it can't be cheap it's just yeah. physically impossible and when you're a startup and you're a small company compared to a big company uh, manufacturing anything is going to be more expensive mm -hmm. because you don't have so much volume so i'm not going to be selling one million keyboards like maybe uh, one of the top companies uh, does in a year i'm going to sell a few thousand so then when you're going to negotiate with factories it's so much more expensive to manufacture anything mm -hmm. so if you take into account that uh, our our keyboard race the body is full it's a full aluminum body so just like a macbook for example mm -hmm. instead of a plastic body this already expensive it's a split keyboard a split keyboard means that you have uh double pcbs the pcb is the printed circuit board where mm -hmm. all, all, the, all the components are shouldered so yep. you have two so even though it's smaller just by having two it's much more expensive and the same you have two aluminum uh, pieces also the cable is a special y-shaped uh, cable that's much more expensive too so if you only take into account the manufacturing processes, the materials and so on, it's already so much more expensive yeah. than, than a keyboard. But on top of this, if you add all the features, uh, all the ergonomics, all the customization options and all this, this keyboard is already better than any other keyboard out in the market. So this is what makes this keyboard expensive. Of course, this is like a special tool, right? It's not just a keyboard. It's not a $15 mm -hmm. keyboard. It's not yeah. just something that you buy, plug and use with a keyboard. It's for... Is designed for people that spend their time in the keyboard and want to get more out of the keyboard. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. As someone with an engineering background, I totally understand that everyone <laughs> wants everything cheap and faster. Yeah, of but um, <laughs> you you definitely do sacrifice on quality when you do that. So it's good to see that you found your niche in the market and your identity, and you're also trying to make the best product you can. So that's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, to be honest. Uh, this is like a gamble in a sense because we are a new company trying to create a let's say premium product yeah. not, not even high level actually premium so over the the market even more expensive that than razor corsair and these mm -hmm. uh, other brands so this is really risky but creating a company to create a product that already does 20 other companies for me it's not exciting and i think it's not something that you're delivering that much value to to other people so I just don't want to go through that path, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. That's great. So is there anything else? Actually, why don't we tell the people where they can find this Kickstarter and all this kind of information if they're interested? Yeah, so the company is called Digma, uh, D-Y-G-M-A, and the keyword is called Race, R-I-R-A-I-S-E. Uh -huh. Sorry, the, the letters in Spanish are a bit different. So when, <laughs> gotcha. when spelling it, it sounds weird. Yeah, so uh, you can go on our website, digma.com, or you can go directly on Kickstarter and look for uh, Digma Race and, and you will find this and you will find the keyboard. And on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we're Digma Lab, L-A-B, like a mm -hmm. laboratory. And yeah, so Digma Lab anywhere. So 
yeah, you can find us on Google, Kickstarter, our website, social media, and so on. Okay, great. And then uh, I believe there is a time limit for the Kickstarter campaign, correct? Yeah, it's 30 days. So we start yesterday. So basically there's a month. And we had the first 250 units at 40% discount. And these were, uh, were sold in, in less than five hours. <laughs> and then the next 500 units have a 30% discount. That the, These are the ones that uh, we are selling right now. Mm-hmm. And after these 500 units, the rest of the units have a 20% discount. Gotcha. And just in case people don't know what Kickstarter is, so it's a platform where you kind of present your project and you get money to be able to execute this project. So in these cases, this money will be used for manufacturing. So mm-hmm. you're this is like a pre-sale you're buying the product before it's manufactured. So with this money, we will manufacture and then we will ship it to, to people that backed our project. So that's why there's uh, so uh, so like so nice discounts, like 40%, 30%, 20%. is because uh, people are, are backing a project that still hasn't been uh, done. Gotcha. And then if we make that order, when can we expect to actually get the product then? Uh, midway through next year for the first batch. And a, and a few months later for the complete watch. Gotcha. And next year you're talking about 2018, correct? Yeah, exactly. Yes, okay. 2018. Perfect. So that's really, really exciting. Good luck with all of that. I'm really, really excited to see what kind of uh, waves that thing creates. So um, thank you very much. Before we end this, let's talk a little bit more about um, esports, League of Legends, and basically anything we really want to talk about. Uh, I know you have your blog, which has been mm-hmm. exciting to follow. And I think something that could be really helpful for our listeners is you've been talking about shot calling recently. Now, Mm -hmm. we don't have people in our community that's super, super hardcore. I don't believe we're trying to get into the LCS and create an amateur organization or anything like that. That being Mm -hmm. said, we have community games where we play and the community likes to play with each other. And a lot of them also like to go into solo queue where shot calling is a totally different beast as well. What mm-hmm. kind of input can you give or what can we talk about to help people become better shot callers in a more, let's say, casual environment where they just feel like they want to help the team, but they're not going to spend, you know, they're not going to spend hours and hours doing research and practicing it and trying to become a quote unquote professional in it. Okay, so you're asking for shot calling tips for Casual gamers that just want to enjoy their games, but improve a little bit their mm-hmm. their communications or calling so yes. and so on. Okay, okay. So um, I would say uh, if you're going in solo queue, mm-hmm. don't try to shot call. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Why <laughs> is that? You try because uh, people normally when you type to people or you are winning. So if you're carrying the game, mm-hmm. then you can ping ping people. Say go here, go there, gang here, and then they will follow. Okay. But if you are dying or you're not having a particularly good game, <laughs> they will think, okay, why I'm going to listen to this guy that it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. Right? So you should not be trying to shot call in, in solo queue. And normally, the the most efficient way of of winning in shot calling, uh, sorry, in solo queue uh, around communication is normally it's muting most of the people, okay. you know, mm-hmm. and, and uh, communicating only with pings. Mm-hmm. That that would be my my uh, suggestion. And maybe if you want to write something, always stay super positive and write good job, well done, mm-hmm. or stuff like this, right? Okay. But don't expect to shot call in solo queue because it's five people with five different plans. Yeah. And there's no guarantee that no one is going to follow no one. Uh-huh. Right? So just with pings, you can get the bare minimum coordination okay if you want to have some fun with friends and and kind of coordinate your communication so i would say that you need to know what kind of uh, people your friends are because there's people that it's open-minded and are willing to follow but there's also people that aren't willing to to follow Mm -hmm. so in general the easiest thing is to make questions and make suggestions but also it's important that uh, that the five these five uh, uh, people accept someone as the as the final call so if there's different people feeding information and making suggestions mm-hmm. and one person has the final call and everyone respects his final call even if it's a wrong call the five and uh, the five guys will follow that call and will execute that call and yeah. normally even though if it's a suboptimal call it would be fine the main issue happens when 
there's a call and then there's another call and then two guys go here and another <laughs> go here and then another one is firing on, on the lane yeah, and then yeah. to to die and start flaming the guy that it's farming <laughs> on the lane <laughs> you know what i mean that's yeah. that's the that's the big issue so these two things so accept someone as the final call not even the shot caller just the final call that this guy says mm -hmm. yes let's do this and then the rest of the people feed information about what they are doing about and about the enemies and suggest you know hey we should do this oh i think we should do that oh this guy uh, this guy is alone in the ring i think we can kill him or whatever okay mm -hmm. but when people are arguing someone has to have the final call and this way and the team would be much more much more coordinated yeah i think um a really good point that you made with that is uh, not that the rest of it wasn't good points but uh, following a call that might be suboptimally altogether. It's something we talk about a lot on the podcast because there are plenty of times to outplay and misplay by both teams. But if you have a cohesive unit doing something together, it just increases the chances of that working out in your benefit. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's what you're saying? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I really totally feel that. It's something that's very... We see that a lot in our community games because, you know, it's just people casually playing. Some people don't hear what's going on or don't register it. And we have a lot of personalities that are conflicting as well in some of the games. So something that definitely happens just following the call is really, really important. Even if it turns out bad, at least you all did it together and it's not, you can hash it out later. Yeah. What about, something, mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Something really important on, on this side is that uh, short calling should be thought as a skill. So it's something that you need to practice. But the only uh, way of practicing shot calling is that if people follow you, because if mm -hmm. you make a call, but then some people don't follow you, then you are not practicing that call because you don't really uh, reach the, the end point of the, that call. You don't know if, if it was uh, correct. You can theory craft if it was correct, yeah. but you actually don't see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to shot call and people don't follow, then you are not practicing your skill and you need to invest time on it. And once you start doing this, then you can do things like, uh, optimizing your communication, like changing your wording or creating a hierarchy of communication, like you can do uh, much more things. But everyone needs to understand, it, like if you accept someone of the uh, someone in your team that uh, to have the last call, you need to let him have the last call. Because if you mm. don't let him have the last call, then this guy is not going to practice, so he will not improve. And that's really yeah. important. And I think uh, if you always think that that person's an idiot and making the bad call, they never get that feedback that it's a bad call because you yeah, all don't exactly. follow it as well. Yeah, that's it. It's super important. Cool. Is there so anything... Let him oh, fail. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, is there anything that you see that might be more common that people are doing absolutely wrong that they need to kind of check themselves when it comes to shot calling? Um, I would say that I'd say there's two main things. And actually, I was going to write, I will write an Ooh, article about exciting. this in, in the future. So uh, one is uh, wording, uh, wording. So mm -hmm. what words you use to say something. So if you say, let's say that, that you're playing Ali Star and you can roam mid, mm -hmm. okay? So if you say, I can roam mid, I can roam mid doesn't mean that you are roaming mid. So <laughs> yeah. if you're roaming mid, you say, I'm roaming mid or I'm going mid or, in 10 seconds, I'm mid, Yeah, you know? So the way, the words you choose to say what modify a lot uh, what the other side receives. Mm -hmm. So your message has to be, has to use the fewer words, the better, and has to be extremely specific. I so see. I'm middling in 15 seconds. It's specific. Yeah. Uh, I can go mid. It's not specific. Mm -hmm. It says that maybe you do it or maybe don't. You don't know. But if you tell your mid laner that you're going mid in, in 15 seconds, then uh, he's aware of this and he can use this, this information. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I see that a lot when we're just like, hey, we should do, we should take bottom turret or we should do dragon. That is a very, yes, we should. Uh, what yeah, does that so mean? What, okay, what we do now? And then two go to the tower, yep. you go to dragon, one goes somewhere else, then the two at the tower get killed, then uh -huh. you don't take dragon. Yeah, of course, exactly. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, and the, the second thing is that the shot color needs to understand what the other side is understanding. So, for example, if you're, let's say, you're on the bot lane and you're, uh, you just kill the bot lane and you're taking the tower and you want your mid laner to hide on fog of war so the enemy jungler doesn't come to, to the tower to defend the tower, mm -hmm. right? So if you tell uh, your mid laner, hey, uh, hover on the bottom side so we can blah, 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 and then you start 
building a sentence. Yeah. Okay, maybe the message is clear, even if you use a few words, but maybe, but you need to think what the mid laner is doing. But let's say that your mid laner is trying to kill enemy mid laner mm -hmm. and he's having a conversation with your jungler. Yeah. Then you need to understand what they are doing. So at that situation, maybe you have to be extremely direct and, and kind of forceful, right? Okay. You should say, uh, come here now and then you ping. Mm -hmm. go, for, go here now, ping, and, and you ping. Right? Yeah. You should not try to explain him what to do and what you're doing and so on. So you need to put yourself in the position of the other guy. So mm. this uh, the other guy can execute what you need, right? And many times the, the shot callers say a message that it's kind of clear, but they don't have in mind that the other player is doing something, you know? And this is important. As a shot caller, you need to have a like a a overview of what everyone is doing and you need to be empathic in this way. You need to understand mm. what they are thinking and how they are feeling uh, about the situation. And then you can become a, a better shirt color. This is complicated, of course. This is like a a, a thing that I would expect uh, like elite level shot colors uh, be able to do and not casual shot colors uh, to do. But once you fix the, your wording, your wording, then you can uh, fix this of kind of knowing what your teammates are doing and how you have to communicate depending on, on what they are doing. And of course, manage, like level your expectations depending on mm -hmm. what they are doing at, at that moment and what you want to do. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I think a lot of, especially uh, a lot of lane, like the <laughs> whole lane to jungle relationship, especially in solo queue, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, the jungler's not camping my, uh, the enemy jungler is camping my lane, why is my jungler here? Or it's like, oh, my laners are so dumb, they're feeding, and there's no understanding of like, what is actually going on? Why did those things happen? What, uh, yeah. oh, the jungler actually is camping top lane because we have a Riven that needs to snowball or something like that. There's a lack of For empathy, example. and I think that's it's a huge thing, and that's a very, very difficult thing, especially in solo queue. And even with your friends, it's also a really tough thing because everyone's so focused on what they're trying to do. And there's a lot to focus on. There's a lot to learn, a lot to concentrate on. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a reason why people don't watch their map because it, it is hard and it's a skill. So adding yeah. communication and shot calling to it is definitely a difficult thing. <laughs> yes. And I, I, I would advice to always think that anything that happens on the map is your fault. Maybe this sounds mm -hmm. weird, but let's say that uh, you're an ADC, okay? And your jungler dies on the top side uh, because he uh, dived the top laner, okay? Yeah. Okay, this may seem something completely off, you know? This is nothing to do with you. But maybe if you would have uh, pinged him about, okay, we're pushing these waves, or maybe if you, if it's in your, I mean, if he's a friend, you could have told him, hey, uh, come here, come bot, because we have pressure, maybe you can invade or something like this, you know? Th this this kind of stuff. So uh, you can always have some impact in what's going on on the map. And when something happens next to you, if you're the ADC and then your jungler comes to gank and he dies randomly, you could have had a direct impact on this. Mm -hmm. So you can always think that you could have done something better. And if you're thinking that you could have uh, done something better, you're go not going to be blaming your teammate mm -hmm. or your friend, you know, because you're focused on improving yourself, not blaming the other person. Yeah. And if you're not a uh, top challenge, top challenger player uh, in Korean ladder, probably you have a lot of stuff <laughs> to improve. Probably. Yeah. Probably. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, let's see. There was one. Oh yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if you can answer this one. And this is a question that's been on my mind recently. Uh, is there a way when you're watching esports game or professional matches and stuff like that? Because, you know, we don't have voice comms. Every team works differently. And teams aren't as transparent as everyone wishes they were. Is there a way to actually tell like how, if communications are good or bad for a team when you're watching an LCS match? Um, you can kind of guess it, okay, but you cannot really know it. Like you can guess it by how the team coordinates and moves around different uh, areas of the map. Mm -hmm. So, um, I remember a really clear example that I haven't heard the comms, but uh, actually, I'm not sure if I heard the comms from this situation. But I rem I have an image on my on my head that when I expect it was ADC on Origin, mm -hmm. there was a game that he was playing. I think it's Seaver, an enemy team has an Olaf. And there were a team fighting in the in the mid lane. And Peke, for some weird reason, he flanks as an ADC that this is terrible. <laughs> and then Olaf's, Olaf turns around and starts just hitting him on the face. Okay. Yeah. And there's a point that uh, there's a team fight in the mid lane, and Peke is here, and Olaf is running to him. 
Yeah. And the whole team, except the mid laner, turns immediately. And then the mid laner dies, you know? Ah, okay. But this is a mistake of the of the ADC of Peke. But just by seeing this, I know that Peke said something and the whole team turned around at, uh, at that point, right? Yeah. So, for example, at, in this situation, you can know that this guy has a voice uh, in the team and you, you can see what's going on. Mm-hmm. So, let's say that your support is the, the main voice. Probably the communication around the bot lane is going to be uh, good. And probably what's going to happen around the bot lane is going to be uh, like, there's going to be good stuff happening around. So just by seeing what are the strong points, you can see, you can kind of think about who can have the the better communication or, or at least who's more demanding. The more demanding a player is, normally the more resources will be invested in into that player. Gotcha. So when I, when I think of, you know, uh, writers or interviewers or people that just have a voice in the community that like to you know, make their best conclusions about games and an analysis and stuff like that. When it comes to being like, oh, Aframu is a shot caller. He's a great shot caller and all this kind of stuff. It sounds like a lot of that information has to be coming from behind the scenes conversations with teams and players and people that are speculating about it. Um, I don't know how much that can be trusted when they say these things were like, oh, they obviously have communication issues. It sounds like you really need to know what's going on with the players and having conversations with players, or at least people that might be uh, at least maybe a little game of telephone where you're talking to someone that has talked to the team to really confidently say this team has communication issues. Uh, okay. So in my experience, what people think that's happening on the LCS and what's mm-hmm. happening in the LCS, it's two completely different things. <laughs> okay. And in this speculation, it's just speculation. Yeah. And uh, there's really little information of what's going on inside the team. So mm-hmm. saying that Afromu is a good shot caller or yeah, it could be, but how much do you know about this? It's a good yeah. shot caller. Like in what area of shot calling? Do you mean macro shot calling or w- w- what do you mean? There are so yeah. many areas okay. on this. And is is he a, a reliable shot caller? Is he not a good shot caller when, when he's having a bad game? Like, I mean, what do you mean? What yeah. is, is a good shot caller? Is he a good shot caller? Uh, when no one else talks and he has to micromanage or is he say a good shot caller when he has a really strong jungler that knows how to path properly and communicate properly and set up gangs and early skirmishes so he can focus on other things you, you know what i mean yeah yeah absolutely uh, like something like communication that you don't see is not like farming and trading in lane as an adc you see how good a guy is farming and trading right mm-hmm. and okay of course it depends on the support too but you see it in the game but something about like communication you don't really know. And the issues with synergy, when someone say, oh, this jungler and this top lane are really bad. Look, they cannot uh, they cannot set up a dive. They don't know how to uh, coordinate. They have no synergy. Mm-hmm. There's no, no synergy could be because they have communication issues or because they have a personal issue or because someone was making a different call or it could be so many things. So uh, like as an as someone that is watching League professionally, trying to understand why things are happening the way they are happening, normally you're going to be wrong normally because you just don't, <laughs> don't have the information. Yeah. 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 I definitely, uh, it's a difficult thing to do to make those kind of conclusions of what's going on, especially for those. Yeah. yeah like you said, those soft skills, the things that aren't very, very apparent on what's going on. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, Daylor, is there anything else you would like to talk about before we round out this episode? Uh, not really. We, we've we already talked about the <laughs> blog, about Big Man, about my career, about yeah. solo queue, about com- competitive league. So yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. Okay. So thank you very much for uh, having me here uh, to talk about the project and my career and so on. Yeah, so absolutely. Thank you. thank you for uh, taking the time to do this as well. I know you're very, very busy. So uh, no for, the, for the last thing, why don't you tell us where people can find you personally and all your content that you're creating? Yeah. So my blog is daylor.blog. Pretty simple. Really easy. And my yeah, my Twitter Twitter and Facebook and so on, it's Luis Daylor. Luis is L U I S. Mm-hmm. So pretty simple. Great. Awesome. And those all the links that we talked about when it comes to Digma and uh, Daylor here will be in the episode description. So yeah, that is it for this episode. Again, thank you, Daylor, for coming on, talking about this. Good luck with the Kickstarter and everything else you're doing. We, I know I can speak for the community as well. We are really excited about what you are doing and what you've done, especially with the League of Legends scene. So again, thank you for this time that you spent with us. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Uh, that is it for this episode. We will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.